Welcome to the Badass Direct Sales Mastery Podcast with your direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Badass Direct Sales Mastery is a podcast for rock star direct sales moms who are determined to make their business kick ass. Jenny will share her knowledge of effective sales and recruiting techniques, tips to get what you want from your business, and will interview direct sales professionals and leaders from various companies. The interviews will give insight to how these rock stars got to where they are and where they plan to grow in the future. And now, the direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Welcome back to another episode of Badass Direct Sales Mastery. And also... Infinite franchisee. Oh my gosh. So if you're wondering, if you're listening on April's show, you're wondering, why am I hearing from someone different? If you're listening to my show, you're like, why is this also infinite franchisee? Well, that's because April and I got together with it. Like, you know what? We're both podcast hosts. Let's just record this one episode and get it out for everybody. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like I'm always teaching my clients you got to work smarter, not harder, right? So this is, we're leading by example here, everybody. I love it. All right. So for my uh, audience, they're called the Badass Crew. Badass Crew, I want to introduce you to April Porter. I was introduced to her. Interestingly enough, a lot of people were asking me, do you know April? Do you know April? I said, no, would you create an introduction? So my friend, Stacy Mitchell, actually introduced the two of us. And April is a former award-winning multi-unit franchisee, an attorney, and the creator of the Infinite Franchisee Mentorship Program and also the Infinite Franchisee Podcast. So congratulations on that. And you have you have had a huge year in 2023 because we're recording this near the end of 2023. Tell, tell me a little bit about your year. What made it so great? Oh, my gosh. Well... We started off the year with one of our visions actually coming to life because one of the things I wanted to bring to our audience of franchisees and small business owners was the SWAG conference. Mm -hmm. And SWAG in our world, it's an acronym we created. It stands for Sanity, Wealth, and Gratitude. And we really feel it encompasses that dream, that vision that we're all working so hard to achieve with the hustle, right? Mm. And so our SWAG conference, um, it was a three-day conference. We had people travel internationally to come, even though it was our first one. And we had the most brilliant speakers who gave us sessions that were concentrated in one of those three areas. And we had people, I mean, when we hit the gratitude sessions, we had people sobbing, even though it was a professional, you know, development conference, but it was transformational sobbing. It was so overwhelming in the emotion and transformation that people just released a lot of emotion, but we got rave reviews for it. I'm extraordinarily proud of it that we like actually made such a difference with it in our first year. And we cannot wait to, you know, bring it back in 2024. Oh, that's exciting. When is it happening? So that'll be in October. We don't have okay. our exact dates picked yet, but we're planning October 2024 for the next iteration of the SWAG conference. Cool. Oh my gosh. Uh, amazing. I love that. All right, cool. So what questions do you have for me for your audience? So they're like, why is she here? <laughs> well, it's so interesting. I remember when we first had our conversation, you know, again, you are an expert in your field and really help people in the direct sales model. Yes. Right. And I help people in the franchise model. And we had a really interesting conversation about direct sales versus franchising. And I, I actually have been hired by a direct sales company to transition them to a franchise. Mm. So that happened in September, which I don't know if we even talked about that, but It's just so interesting. I have a background in direct sales as well before I became a franchisee. I think a lot of people actually, would you agree with this? A lot of people first dip their toes into business ownership through a direct sales company. I would agree. Um, I see a lot of entrepreneurs and have lots of conversations with entrepreneurs who tell me that at some point in their entrepreneurial journey, and for some of them, they're still in it because they're like, hey, it's a great side gig. It's a great 
thing that I, uh, another product, another service that I can offer in addition to this other thing that I'm doing. But a lot of them got started. And that's true for me too. I was a teacher when I started my adult careering, right? I was a middle school science teacher, took some time off to be a mom. And then when I tried to get back into teaching, it wasn't happening. Like went on 18 interviews in 2010 and heard over and over and over again, we love you. We wish we could hire you, but you're too expensive. You have too much experience. So we're going with this person who's a brand new college grad because our school district just doesn't have the money to pay a teacher like you. And so I was like, okay, so universe, if I'm not supposed to be in the classroom, what am I supposed to do? And literally a few days later in the mailbox shows an inv- shows up an invitation to a direct sales event. And I went to the event thinking, oh, I'll help my sister-in-law like move forward and like I'll buy a necklace because it was a, a jewelry event. It's like, I'll buy a necklace, help her build her business. And I walked out of there with my own business because I saw the potential uh, for what was going on. And so that really helped me get me started. Like, had you told me 15 years ago I would be in entrepreneurship, I would have laughed you out of the building. (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? I have to say that my story is very similar to that. So I was a prosecuting attorney at the time, which is one of the many careers I've had. (laughs) But I was a prosecutor for 10 years. And my job was, I specialized, you're considered a specialist in sex crimes, child abuse, and homicides. Yeah. And that was like a, a specialty because you're in court all the time. You know, you're dealing with very heavy subject matter. You have to be able to really understand how to connect with the victims. In addition, you know, you have to be a bulldog to be able to go to court and and get justice. So it does require quite a specialty, but it also resulted in many days where I would come home and I'd had just a really crappy day Mm. and I would be tired and exhausted and just and that. And so one day we had moved into a new neighborhood and I had been invited to go to a woman's house for an evening, for a spa night. And I came home from that day of work and I was like, I don't want to go. My husband was like, aren't you going to go down to the neighbors? And I said, I don't feel like it. I've had a bad day. I don't want to go down. And he said, well, isn't that exactly why you should go down there? And, you know, it was very sweet. It was. But I went down and I was like the jerk. I was the (laughs) jerk in the room because I was in such a like not a good headspace, you know? So I was like, they're going to try to get me to buy stuff. I don't want to buy this crap. You know, I just, and I'm trying to meet people, but feeling very disconnected because of all the stuff going around in my head. So anyway, as we're, as we're going through this and I'm like being kind of a jerk about the products or whatever, the woman was talking about how she, you know, she had, she was wearing jewelry that like real jewels, you know, that yeah. she had earned as as sales incentives. And she had a car that was paid for by the company and she was taking all these trips. And I'm like, I'm selling this stuff. And what was great about it, and I'm sure you would agree and your first direct sale company as well too, the product truly was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, it was like spa quality skincare. And so that's what I was like, you know, I mean, if she can do it, I could do it. And that, and To be quite honest, I believe one of the best gifts from a direct sales company, being part of direct sales company gives you is finding a true tribe of people, especially as a woman, of support and encouragement. And um, and I desperately needed that at the time, too, because of how heavy everything was that I dealt with during the day. And that's how I got into direct sales. Oh, my gosh. And your story is not the first I've heard like that. And anybody who were to go and listen to my 200 plus interviews that I have with people who are in the industry, they'd tell you, I heard it time and again, it was one of those things where I got invited to a thing, I went and I was like, Oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Or this is better than I thought it was going to be. Or if she can do it, I can do it. (laughs) Right? Right. Um, Because yeah, that's really what it came down to. And and many of us, I think, see direct sales as 
an answer to a, is this all there is? Or, you know, how else can I contribute to my family? Because that's what it was for me. I wanted to get back so I could contribute to my family. My original goal with starting with direct sales was gas and groceries. If I can pay for my gas, because I drive an SUV, if I can pay for my gas, if I can pay for groceries, that makes my husband's life a little bit easier. And that was my original goal. Well, I hit gas and groceries really freaking quick. (laughs) So then it was just moving into the next, oh, well, if I can do that, what else can I do? What what else is next? And I I think, and I don't know how you went into your business. For me, I went into it like, I'm going to do this as business. I'm not going to try. Like the agreement I had with my husband at the time was, look, this is a business opportunity. This means it's going to take more than 90 days for me to figure this thing out. So can we agree that I'm going to do this for a year? Like, can you support me in this for one year? And he was like, okay, that's fine. What does that look like? You know, well, support looks like take care of the kids when I need to go to parties and trainings, you know, help out when and where you can in the house so that I can get stuff done. That's what it looks like. And he was like, okay. And I said, also support looks like not complaining about the business. (laughs) Yes, that's a big one. <laughs> you know, I did not get that agreement. I just came home with a business and my husband is not an entrepreneur, despite oh. the fact that now, you know, since then I've owned four kickboxing gyms and I have, you know, an international online coaching company. And despite <laughs> all of that, my husband still has not evolved into being an entrepreneur himself, although he has become more like less anxious about my entrepreneur, you know, streak, but he's completely opposite. So I, I had the opposite experience, which I'm sure many of your listeners have had. And I know many of my, many of my listeners also have this where they have a spouse who is risk adverse. Yeah. And it does put so much pressure and you do feel really tugged between what you think, what you feel like in your bones that you can accomplish and what you, and you feel like the more that you are working to accomplish those things, the more you're letting your spouse down, Mm -hmm. which is really a hard spot to be in. Yeah. And like, like I said, he, we've, we have found our balance now, but those early days it was very much of it, you know, constantly trying to justify why my Friday and Saturday nights, you know, were full and how it was, why it was worth pursuing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, and I think too, there, that part of that balance, and I did the same thing. Like when I first started, my weekends were full and, you know, my husband and I had to have the conversation of, you know, hey, yes, you, we want you to be successful in business. And we also want to see you because he worked uh, and still works. And we're not married any longer, but works a, a nine to five, a Monday through Friday, cor- you know, corporate style job. And so weekends and evenings were the only times I could see him. And so when I first got started, I have a little bit of a workaholic streak in me. And if I'm not careful, yeah, I totally misjudge the balance on that. <laughs> So I started setting up little rules and guidelines for myself that was, you know, if I already had a party booked for Friday, then Saturday night stayed open. Right. So that way I always had time with the family. So or if Saturday night got booked then Friday night got crossed out, not available, that's my family time. And people understood that and they really respected it. It was, oh, yeah, that that's that's a good idea. You know, it was, it was really great moving forward once I established that. Cause I think had I continued the way it was, I would have burned myself out. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it is an important thing to realize right out of the gate, regardless if it's direct sales, franchising, small business, whatever it is, is if you start out allowing your customers to dictate your schedule, you will never achieve the time freedom that most people are actually seeking through being a business owner. And so from the get-go, you need to control the schedule. And to be quite honest, when you do, it makes you more desirable. Mm -hmm. Because when you have an exclusivity and say, okay, let's get you scheduled. Let's see, I have, you know, the rest of December, I don't, is completely booked. 
I'm actually booked through the middle of January. I have this date and this date in January. Then people are like, well, I better take a date Mm -hmm. because otherwise it's going to be March before I can get it. Just think about your hairdresser, right? Right. If you really want to get your hair done before Christmas, you better be booking that. In In September. (laughs) September, right? (laughs) But we don't don't get upset with their hairdresser. We just make sure we get our appointment on the books and that we don't cancel it because we want to get in. Same thing for you as a business owner. Yes. And for those of you who are not watching this, right? So you guys miss me celebrating (laughs) when April was first talking about this because I have had this conversation not just with people in direct sales, but I've had like, for example, chiropractors say, oh, well, I can't, I can't go to that networking thing during that time because, and I'm like, who's in, can, I'm sorry, are you the business owner or are you like, I'm, con- I'm confused. I thought you owned the business and they're like, well, I do. And I'm like, so you can have your office hours whenever you want it to be. You can change that. You, you know that, right? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. You know, it. It absolutely, there the number of people who are still in the, they're still self-employed, not business owners yet, you know? Oh, yes. And it all goes back to scarcity mindset and, you know, that, that fear that if I don't bend over backwards for this person, then, mm-hmm. then I'm going to lose a sale. And that it, it's coming from insecurity. It's coming from scarcity. And to make a shift and to be empowered to leave that behind, what it takes is it takes acknowledging that first. You have to acknowledge like, wow, I actually do show up in scarcity. I'm afraid I'm going to lose out on things. I look at the world and I see that there's not enough. If I lose this sale, then there won't be another one, right? And you have to acknowledge that about yourself first. And you and then literally you can just decide not to believe that anymore. Now it's that's easier said than done for some people. Yeah. Some of us can process very quickly and say, "Well, oh wow, yeah, I drew attention to that. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it." Some others may not be able to do that. So that's where I would really recommend starting to look into some professional development books and um, that that teach you about law of attraction and those types of things. Um, because that's where I really started to learn back in my early days of owning the kickboxing gyms. I listened to the book, The Secret, Mm. and I think it's a great beginner book for being introduced to the idea of limiting beliefs and how you can create your own reality through the way that you think. But it really did help me change my perspective and, and begin calling in things and, and and that's what has to happen for people to be able to say, no, I'm not losing out on anything by putting up a boundary that makes sense. And actually doesn't just make sense, but it nurtures what I really want out of life because I, I'm doing, most people are doing all of this to create a better life for their families. Mm-hmm. And then they're not seeing their families because they're working so hard in the business. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, and, and I think the, so to transition this, by the way, great book recommendation, The Secret, if the listener right now has not read that book or watched the documentary, go do one or the other. I recommend that book as well as a great starter piece. Um, My other favorite book that helped me down that realm as well is Success Principles by Jack Canfield. Oh, that book was a game changer for me. Like, oh my God, I really honestly believe that book should be required reading in high school for every human being. Oh, there's so many books I should, I believe should be required reading in high school. Like other than the literary, I mean, the literary grades are great, but yeah, but can we get some things that are actually going to help with some emotional intelligence and some you know, Mm -hmm. like you, like success and, uh, learning how to think, not what to think and those types of things. That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast, Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. Agreed. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And then 
transition this over because one of the interesting conversations you and I had was the difference between franchising and and the direct sales. Because I've, how do I want to say this? I've mentioned in the past that direct sales is like a mini franchise. Like you have a mini franchise. You have rules that you need to follow from the company. There are certain things that can and can't be said and certain things that can and can't be done. But for the most part, you're also then an entrepreneur, right? But you had some different thoughts about that. And so I wanted to share that with my audience as well, and then allow your audience to begin to see that, you know, direct sales isn't this pyramid scheme, (laughs) you know, that a lot of people have as a negative side, because I'd love to talk about that. But let's start with the difference between direct sales and multi-level marketing and the, the franchise model. Right. No, um, actually, it's it's so interesting because, of course, now I'm totally, completely a deep dive into direct sales from the corporate side as I work with this company to become a franchise. But when I first showed up, that's what the uh, leaders were saying is, you know, oh, direct sales and franchising, it's the same thing. It's just essentially like a different contract. And I'm like, whoa, 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 it's not the same thing. <laughs> and and I don't say that from like, you know, because there isn't, we, let's just, you know, you got to call a spade a spade. There's a stigma r- around direct sales these days. Yes. And so when I say they're not the same thing, that's not coming from a place of like, oh, let's not, we don't want to be associated with direct sales as a franchise. Right. It comes from a place of education, right? Yes. What are the differences? Right. What are the differences? And so the, there's a few differences. So one of the biggest things that I think people don't actually realize is that the words multi-level marketing come from the revenue plan. Yes. When you when a corporation or when a company compensates its sellers more than two levels deep, you are a multi-level marketing company, period. That's yep. by law. Yep. So... It has nothing to do with the fact that there's an army of people out there selling this product because guess what? There's army, there's armies of people selling roofs. Yeah. I mean, how many times has someone knocked on your door and said, hey, we're with the roofing company. A storm just came through. We want to get on the top of your roof, right? But yet we don't have that same distaste. I mean, we don't like people knocking on our doors, <laughs> but, but our brains don't say, Oh, that's that's a scam, and that's a that's a direct sale company because they right. knocked on my door, right? That's that pyramid scheme. But that's yeah. a pyramid scheme, right? We don't we don't think that. We think it's a legitimate business, or maybe a subpar legitimate business, right? You know, that's knocking on your door, but we don't just in, immediately accuse it of being a pyramid scheme, right? So the the real difference is that a multi level marketing company has pays down multiple levels. Yes. And that's that's the legal definition. Now mm-hmm. in a franchise, to my knowledge, currently there is there are no franchises that pay multiple levels. Right. Okay. Right. Now that may change as we create our hybrid that is going to revolutionize a couple of industries. But so that would be one of the distinctions, although probably the most obvious and not really the most relevant distinction between the two. Mm-hmm. The other distinction is that when you are part of a direct sales company and you enroll, you usually click a box that says, I agree to the policies and I agree to follow the policies, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't actually have to put your signature on a contract. And the company isn't putting a counter signature on the contract. So how much protection do you really have as a direct seller? Well, In those policies, the revenue plan can be changed at any time. Yep. So you may you may begin this journey and be excited and and you might even be building your organization to pay to maximize your payments with the company. And then bam, they change the revenue plan Mm -hmm. and your income drops. Yep. That has happened. We've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. Many people, many companies, many times. Yep. So that's one big, that's one thing on the direct sales side. We'll get to what the franchising equivalent to that is in a moment. Sure. The other piece is that because of that, you can also be terminated at any point in time. Yeah. There is no, there is no requirement that you be given 30 days notice. 
that you have the opportunity to fix whatever they say you've done wrong. To be quite honest, they don't even have to have a reason for cutting you loose. Mm -hmm. You have no protection. So again, if you've built a nice organization, you've nurtured people, you've mentored people, you you have put all this time, energy, and, and your own money into building your business, and it could be gone like that. Yep. Seen it happen. And, See, yep, we've seen it happen. And mm -hmm. guess what? You do not have a legal leg to stand on to fight for what you have built. Let's talk about franchising. Yes. So franchising, franchising, two of the big protections you have is that you are signing a franchise agreement. Mm. You sign it. The company signs it. Generally, you're signing it with an entity. So you would even go so far as to create a business entity. Many people choose an LLC and you sign it as a biz as the business entity and the franchisor signs it. Now, if you're familiar with why would you want a business? First of all, I think every direct salesperson on the planet should also have a business entity because it protects you and it protects your assets separate from those of your company. And so if you want more information about that, just let me know. And I, I'm happy to go into that more. But um, but fr from a franchise perspective, usually you are signing as a business entity to insulate your personal assets with the agreement and the franchise. The franchise agreement is for a specific term. And on average, I would say most franchise agreements are 10 years. Now, okay. let's look at what that means in relation to the direct sales. That means for 10 years, they cannot charge, they cannot change the way you earn money. Mm. For 10 years, they cannot terminate you. Right. Just for any reason. Now, if you violate the franchise agreement, they can tell you you violated the franchise agreement and you have X number of days to cure, it's called a cure, to cure whatever the violation is. And the, the number of days varies depending on the state you live in. Sure. But so if you did something that that jeopardized the brand because you made a mistake in marketing, they can come at you and they can come at you strong and say, hey, we're going to terminate you for that. But if you can say, well, wait a second, I'll take it down. I'll retract it. What do I need to do to return us back to where we were? If you can do that, they cannot terminate you. Right. So it's a... So you have more control or maybe you have more certainty going into a franchise as to what your you're um, protected, like how your income is protected. At the end of the term, you usually have the right to renew. So you're not also at the mercy at their mercy at the end of 10 years. You know, you can still renew it. You can sell it. You can yeah. pass it to your heirs. You this is your business. So as you're building equity into it, you mm -hmm. are creating an asset that can be sold for more than just what you made the past year in it. Right. 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 So those are some of the really like big differences. The other big difference is that because the franchising, uh, because franchising model is regulated by the FTC, but specifically by what's called the franchise rule, there is a rule in place where prior to signing a franchise agreement, mm -hmm. you must be provided all of the uh, policies and all of the things that you're going to have to follow. That's called disclosures. So just like when you go to buy a house and you get a whole stack of disclosures from the bank, right? Mm -hmm. That tell you what you're agreeing to with your mortgage and all title company, all that same thing for franchise. Now here's the rule. You have to have at least 14 days to review those disclosures before you can sign a franchise agreement. Okay. Fair. Okay. So let's now let's put this in direct sales context. Right. <laughs> I go to the spa night that I went to back in the day, grumpy mm -hmm. April. Uh, I get won over by the spa and I'm like, man, I really want to take advantage of this business opportunity. Mm -hmm. If that was a franchise, I could say, I want to I want to do this. And the woman who hosted or the woman who is the consultant. Right. She would say, great, let me get you hooked up with our corporate office so they can get you the disclosures. 
at that point in time, I would get the disclosures and I'd have 14 days before I could actually become a consultant. Hmm. And so this, for many people in the direct sales world, is scary. They're like, whoa, wait, because we're yeah. used, because they're used to like selling on, you know, the excitement of the moment. Yes. Right? Very much so. Very much right. so. Yeah. yeah. So the difference too in in franchising is that you're not looking to sell on the situation. Mm -hmm. You're looking to sell to the right person. Yes. The person who isn't going to come in and leave in the first year. The person who wants to run it into the end zone. That's mm -hmm. who you're going to sell to. And so while a lot of people feel like, well, I don't want to be part of a franchise because it's going to be so much harder to find customers and to find, you know, to, to build a business that way, direct sales is so easy to build a business. The reality is 60% of people who join a direct sales company leave in the first year. Yep. Mm -hmm. And most of them don't that, even make it the first year. No, they don't make it the first. That's what I'm saying. They don't make it the first year. The first so six months, half the time, it seems like. Right. right. So let's like, what really is the harder job? Is the harder job when you have a really amazing business opportunity that, mm -hmm. that gives people the opportunity to earn more money, to create a flexible schedule and does all the things it's going to promise. Mm -hmm. Is it finding the person who wants that and getting them on board to do that long term? Is that the hard thing? Or is it? Um, or is that harder or is it harder to constantly be replacing people and then training people and then they don't work out? And I mean, to me, I'd rather build a really strong business of like a whole football team that wants to run into the end zone than mm -hmm. half my team be spectators that would rather be popping the popcorn in the stands. Yes. Yes. Oh, I've had this conversation so many times. It's literally... <laughs> a masterclass that I teach in my business for people who want to grow a team is how do you find those people that you were describing that want to do the business? Like, where do you find them? Like quit offering this and trying to sign everybody up because when you sign everybody, you get everybody. And I mean that in the good, the bad, <laughs> you know? So you get the people who are dramatic and you get the people who are a pain in the butt. You get the negative Nellies. You get the 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 people who aren't working the business. It just you get everybody. But you occasionally, occasionally get a rock star. What if you could have a team full of rock stars? Like, yes. But I think, too, there's also a huge difference between the direct sales and network marketing and the amount that's invested up front, obviously. Oh, and that's yeah. Why it's so much easier to get into direct sales, because I don't know about you, but for my bit, my first business for the, when I got into the jewelry business at the time, it was a $5 registration fee. And then what I paid for my hostess jewelry, I got my kit paid for with my first party and I made a commission check. Yeah. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, it was, yeah. it was, it was less than 200 bucks total, all told. With tax, shipping, everything, less than $200 for me to start my business. And so easy in also means easy out. That's right. Right. Franchises are not $200. No, not generally. <laughs> not generally. The, um, yeah, skin in the game is a real, is a th real thing, mm -hmm. right? It's a real thing. Like, Having skin in the game is important, in my opinion, to run a business. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be, you know, $100,000 skin in the game because it's all relative. To some people, $500 of skin in the game is very significant. When I was in, uh, when I owned my kickboxing gyms, we used to run a challenge where you paid $500 down. And if you came and you did what you're supposed to do during the whole challenge, you could get that $500 back. Why? Because it was skin in the game. Yeah. And there were people stressed out about getting that $500 back, right? Because it was significant to them. So it doesn't have to be a huge amount of money to be significant, but I do believe there needs to be skin in the game. Yeah. In franchising, though, I think another big misconception is that if you don't have a large savings or a pool of money, then you can't afford to be a franchisee. 
And this misconception comes because people who have never owned a business before, myself included, back in the day, we're so used to going to the bank and asking for money on the personal side. And the question is, well, how much income do you bring in each month and how much do you have for a down payment, right? Yeah. On the business side, it's a completely different experience because what they look Mm -hmm. at is how much money will the business generate? And based on how much money the business is going to generate, well, you're going to be able to pay your monthly payment. Right. So it's not contingent upon how much money is coming into your household. Right. Because it's your business is generating the money. Your house isn't actually generating an income for you each month. That's why the mortgage people aren't saying, aren't looking at it that way. But just for anybody who's listening, don't ever assume that you cannot afford to follow a dream in business. Rather, assume that you haven't talked to the right person yet to help you find out how to follow that dream of business. And that's like a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It, it absolutely... It, I think oftentimes our our limiting beliefs to go take this back full circle, right? Our limiting beliefs come from our own understandings and misunderstandings and lack of knowledge, ignorance. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. We can't possibly know everything. It's, It's just not possible because we just haven't had that experience yet, right? But those limiting beliefs, if we can find someone who says, hey, that's that's not true. Let me let me show you the way. Let me light the path for you that shows you how to get from, you know, point A to point Z, you know, and all 24 other stops along the way. That's invaluable, right, to have that person who can who's been there, done that and can take you down that path that has been. Is is huge for people. I mean, that's why even I, as a coach, have my own coaches because I haven't been down the marketing path. I haven't been down the coaching path. I haven't been down the referral marketing path. I needed someone to teach me all of those things, you know. And I'm guessing you have the same. You've got people you work with, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that's when my business journey really started to. T- I mean, I took a huge leap, right? When I got my first coach, um, you do as much as you can do with the knowledge you have and you can be very successful, right? In fact, most people who get into business have been high achievers somewhere in their lives before. And if you're, if you're going to grind, you, you can reach a certain level of success, but then to actually get out of where you are now, Mm -hmm. You generally need someone to show you how to get to where you want to be. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have somebody who's been there and, you know, <laughs> done the work, learn the the ropes and be able to say, hey, that, that path right there looks attractive and <laughs> right. <laughs> probably right. not the one for you. Right. So right. that it, it, I think is is invaluable. Well, this has been such a fascinating conversation. <laughs> Well, before we get off, I'd love, yeah. if we have some time, I'd love to give you one more big difference between franchising oh, yes. and direct sales, because I think that this is the most important distinction. Ooh, okay. Yes, please. Okay. So because in direct sales, you are an independent contractor, yes. which we've talked about how that works with the contract and how you can be, you know. Right. Like go at any time. no loyalty to you really at all. Right. What that also means is that the company can only dictate so much of how you run your business Mm. because due to employment laws, as an independent contractor, you have to have the ability to run your business as you see fit. This is why in direct sales, a lot of the training that you receive is actually coming from other people in the field instead of from the corporate office. Now you might get product training from the corporate office, but when you're talking about actual business training and how to grow and how to scale, that's coming from your peers. Yeah. Now think about someone who has the best intentions. We've all seen this happen. They have the best of intentions. They want to succeed. They come into the company and the person who signed them up doesn't know any more than they do. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> right. And they don't feel comfortable going to the stranger that's, you know, two levels up 
right. to get the mentorship and advice. And maybe they don't live in the area to be able to attend the monthly meetings that are happening at that person's house. So they're disconnected. And this is part of why we see that fall off, right? Yeah. In franchising, it is the duty of the franchisor to provide training and support that teaches you not just about the product, but how to operate the business mm -hmm. according to a systematized and structured model that leads to success. Mm -hmm. So now every person coming in is getting training and support that is consistent, no matter if they live in Florida and the person who brought them in lives in Texas. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or they went and heard this from one person, but then a completely inconsistent thing from someone else and they're confused. That, no. It's all consistent, strategic, and structured. And so I think that's an important distinction as well. I, I agree. And there are companies that are doing that. There are direct sales companies that are saying, hey, here's the trainings on how to do X, Y, and Z. Now, in some cases, it's because they got rid of the multi-level model. And they don't have anybody to be the leader and train any longer. So they've taken that on. I think there's also been, based on the case that uh, was the FTC against Neora, that ruling came down in, I think, early October. That's also seemingly creating some new shifts in the way things are happening. Because one of the things that came out of that ruling is the judge said that companies are no longer liable for what their reps say, especially on, for example, so social media. But that now means that the reps are no longer covered by the company because when they used to make those mistakes, the company would say, hey, you need to go take that down. Right. And they could take it down. Hopefully they would. Right. Because if the company says you really can't have that because the FTC says no. Well, now the company doesn't have to do that. And now the reps are really even less protected than before because now the FTC can now go after individual reps in theory. Do Is that going to happen? I don't know the answer to that. Well, but, it is, but it won't know. come from the FTC. It's going to come from, okay, as an attorney, I feel like I can say this, it's going to come from body bottom feeding attorneys who know that if they see it and they go after you, it's a statutory fine. There is no if, ands, or buts. You do not need to pass go. All they need to do is file the paperwork and you owe them the statutory amount. So it's an wow. easy penny day. So um, and to to just to highlight an important distinction with that mm -hmm. with that opinion. Yeah, that is not true for all companies across the board. That's true for very specific circumstances that appear in that particular case with that company and the circumstances around it. And that's where too. Again, me being an attorney and mm -hmm. understanding like what case law actually means right. is that sometimes decisions come down from a court and it's easy to say, oh, well, then that applies to everyone. But generally, there, you know, there's there's always circumstances that are unique to that story. Yeah. And every yeah. case is actually a story of how something sh shook out. Yeah. And so yeah. the way it shook out in that case Okay, it applies to that scenario. Another rep could do that in another company, and it could be a completely different story and a different opinion, particularly if it's in an industry mm -hmm. that is regulated differently. Not meaning direct sales. Let's be let's be clear about that. Direct sales actually isn't an industry; it's a model. Yes, industry is like the health and beauty industry, um, the telecommunications industry. We know there are direct sales companies in all these industries. Yeah. Right. But while it might be true in the beauty and health industry, it it would not be true in the telecommunications industry. Mm. So you got to be careful in making that assumption and thinking, oh, now I can go out and just post whatever I want and I'm safe or I'm not safe. I would say, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, and you want to do what's right anyway, you know, not just post whatever you want, because part of. I mean, if you look at, for example, what happened during COVID, all of the reps for a variety of companies were posting things like, you know, immune boosting and this is going to kill COVID. And they had no proof of that. There was no, no, you know, 
And so the FTC was able to reach out and sent letters to companies. Like I remember going and reading all mm-hmm. of the letters to the original 16 companies that they sent to. And then they sent a second round of letters because what they were doing is they were following hashtags. Right. They were going on social media and saying, you know, OK, who posted hashtag immune boosting, hashtag, you know, income. Mm-hmm. like Because there were also income claim letters that went out. There were, you know, immunity claims that were made, you know, kind of thing. So there was that going on during that. But then, yes, this specific case that actually started pre-COVID <laughs> uh, for Neora was the the difference being there based on what I've seen when I've looked at other cases where the FTC has said something to a company, for example, it came down to, in this case, Neora had all their numbers. They were able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt because they they kept their numbers. I have no idea which companies do that, which ones don't. Mm -hmm. One would hope, fingers crossed. And yet sometimes it doesn't happen. (laughs) So, you know, as the the benefit is that for direct sellers, you are an independent contractor. So you can be the one to make sure you take care of your stuff and do things the right way and do things in integrity and alignment with your values that are hopefully positive. So, yep. And the best that. piece of advice is just don't guess. Yeah. Don't assume, oh, well, I can do this. I can do that. It's not that big of a deal. It's your duty as a business owner to, to operate lawfully. So find out, you know, and ask the right questions to the right people in order to intelligently run your business and protect yourself. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. I feel like we could go on and on forever. Um, and I and I know we're going to have some people come back and about the, well, direct sales, people can leave their business to their heirs. And yes, and some companies do it, some companies don't. There are certain ways to do it in some companies and, and other companies do it different ways. So we can have that conversation another time. <laughs> right. And, so. and yes, and, and, and I didn't mean to say that you can't do that. Right. You're just protected to be able to do that more so in the franchising world. Agreed. Absolutely. No, I I definitely can see how that's going to be a much different way of doing it, we'll say. Oh, yeah. Compared to in the direct sales industry. Well, if you get a lot of questions and a lot of like feedback on this, let's just take them and do another round. Heck yes. Yes, absolutely. So April, um, if somebody has some questions, maybe they're going, you know what, maybe I want to look into franchising or maybe they have some questions ar- around that. How would you like them, my audience to reach out to you? Well, you can listen to the Infinite Franchisee podcast. I mean, we, we're we always talking franchising there, but you can also find us at AskAprilPorter.com or um, InfiniteFranchisee.com. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, fantastic. I love that. And Jenny, thank you so much for joining us on the Infinite Franchisee podcast. I think this is a really important conversation because I'm guessing most of my listeners have straddled both worlds before and might even be involved in both worlds right now, even as they run their franchise. I mean, I, I mean, I know I am. So <laughs> why wouldn't every why wouldn't everybody else, you know, take advantage of any opportunity to boost your income? Direct sales is a great way to do it. So how do people find you? Oh, great question. Uh, so of course, the Badass Direct Sales Mastery podcast is a great place to go listen. We talk about, we talk direct sales, network marketing, and MLM all the time. Uh, and also just general business practices because I don't care how you get paid. Business is business is business. So I have coaches, authors, speakers who have a variety of expertises. So yes, a franchise expert on the show. Uh, in addition to many others. Um, and they can go to badassdirectsalesmastery.com to check out more of what I have out there. So if they'd like to learn more about how to increase their sales and direct sales, how to grow a team, because leading a volunteer army is very different than leading people who work for you when you're the franchise owner and you've got, you know, 1099 employees. Try telling a ten, a, a, a a 1099 employee versus a W-2, <laughs> you know? So you are, or sorry, your 1099 team member who doesn't actually 1099 to you, the 1099 to the company, you mm-hmm. have no power over your team in all actuality. So learning those different leadership concepts um, is something that I love to work on is if you can lead a volunteer army, you can lead anybody. <laughs> so right. We do that. So 
absolutely check out badassdirectsalesmastery.com uh, for more information. Very cool. And badass crew, I'm going to say this because you guys know this is how we wrap up every episode. Stay tuned because there's another badass episode on its way. Thanks for listening to the Badass Direct Sales Mastery Podcast with your direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Why are you waiting to go to badassdirectsalesmastery.com? Don't make the dom get her whip. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with another rock star that you know in direct sales after you subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any future episodes. You can also check out the show notes for links and any contact information mentioned in today's episode. We'll see you next time.